to introduce myself just one more time. I'm the graduate student advisor for SWAP. I'm a grad student in the ITAM program specializing in data analytics. Um, and I am honored to be moderating tonight's conversation. Just to give a little background to what this conversation is meant to be, our team planned this event in hopes for the community and students to come together and discuss how you can get involved in the local community and how to avoid the pitfalls of performative activism. So like Jamie and Spencer have said, Jamie will be moderating the questions. So if you do have a question, you can either raise your hand using the Zoom function um, or you can put your question within the chat and Jamie will make sure that it is asked. We will be taking questions throughout in order to keep the conversation engaging and relevant to the group that is here tonight. Also, I'd like to say that our panel, um, I'm going to introduce them shortly. The whole panel prefers pronouns she, her, and hers. So I just want to announce that beforehand. And if you have a preference as an attendee, you can go ahead and enter your Zoom name. If you right click your name, you can rename yourself and list your pronouns if you feel comfortable doing so. Next, um, I just want to move into introducing our panelists. So first we have Elena Payton-Jones. She is a CWU graduate with a Bachelor of Arts in Public Relations who wears many hats. She's an activist, a Zoom tutor for elementary school children, and a social media consultant. She believes that the hardest step forward is the first one, no matter what you're doing. So thank you for being here, Elena. Next, we have Sara Omrani, a CW undergraduate student majoring in law and justice, and she is a political organizer for Ellensburg Calls to Action. As the child of a political refugee, she feels passionately about advocating for social justice and being critical of oppressive and violent government administrations. So nice to see you, Sara. And last, we have Simone Brown, a CW undergraduate majoring in business marketing, and she plays on the women's basketball team here at Central. She is the president of the Student Athletes for Social Justice. She's a very passionate about the issues that are going on in our world and is trying to make a difference in our community. So welcome, Simone. Thank you all three again for being willing to come and be a part of this panel discussion. So I just wanted to start the night with this first question and I'm gonna direct it to all three of you. Um, we'll start, I think, with Sara and then Elena and then Simone. And so the first question is, what was the catalyst for you getting started in activism and what social movements or causes are you most active with currently? So we'll start with Sara. Just had to lean forward and unmute myself. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's difficult to put my finger on exactly what the moment that my activism started was. Um, I think I, I think I wrote about this in class. I don't think that I talked about it in an interview, but, um, I'm, uh, a child of a political refugee. He's an indigenous person of Iran. And I was in third grade when 9-11 happened. And uh, that was the first time I really became aware of like, oh, people didn't like me like for a reason. Like there was a concrete reason and people were um, saying things like calling me racial slurs and they were um, saying like, you know, we should just bomb the whole Middle East. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's, not cool. Um, and so I stopped saying like the Pledge of Allegiance, stopped holding, you know, my hand over my heart, stopped standing, um, didn't like, I don't take my hat off um, when the flag is, I don't know, like when the national anthem is being sung. Um, and in terms of local activism, I first got involved through um, being asked to moderate and admin a feminist organization in Seattle that was, I think there was about 2,000 members at our largest time. Uh, and I have also been involved with the Kittitas County Democrats. Um, um, but now um, I stopped organizing for a little while just because it felt like white people in this town were not ready to hear what um, needed to be said. Like a lot of people were still, um, 
very upset about the statement Black Lives Matter. They felt like that statement was racist um, or discriminatory towards white people. And what sparked my current endeavors right now with Ellensburg Calls to Action is there was a Black Lives Matter march on June 1st, and I did not ever expect to see that many people at an event, an, a racial equity event in Ellensburg. I didn't expect that many people to show up in support of Black Lives Matter. And I felt like maybe people are finally ready to least listen. Maybe people are ready to finally have these conversations and it won't just be me screaming into the void and people being like, why is she so angry? Um, so that is what led to what I'm currently doing um, and a little bit of background on my activism. Thanks so much for asking. Thank you for sharing that. Um, next we'll move to Elena. Uh, hi everybody. So um, I also have, I mean, <clears throat> some background here from my family. So my mom is a really active political person. I apologize, my dog is chewing on a bone behind me. Um, so if you hear that, I apologize. But um, mm -hmm. my mom is a really politically active person. And as a person of color, I'm, I'm a mixed race individual. I definitely feel like it's more like an imperative to be involved in activism than it is a choice uh, because it feels like you either have to speak up or you get run over. And um, I'm not someone who enjoys being run over. <laughs> so I kind of didn't have a choice in, in becoming someone who had a voice. And um, I also, so I was only at Central for a year and I did graduate. Uh, this year. But I started at University of Alaska Anchorage, and so that was my first time being away from home. And while I was there, there was an incident with uh, It's Okay to Be White posters that were put up in um, an effort to make marginalized people feel uncomfortable and feel unwelcome on University of Alaska Anchorage's campus. And that was right around when Charlottesville happened. So tiki torches and um, kind of, you know, Proud Boys esque statements being thrown around definitely made me feel like I needed to say something. And I took part in an It's Okay to Be panel uh, put on by the Black Student Union on that campus. So that was sort of my first opportunity to speak out more publicly. But I think that my first opportunity to be an activist was when my mom took me to protest the lack of unions at Walmart when I was like 12. So here we are. Thanks for having me. Thank you as well for sharing. And I'm already having a couple questions pop up in my head, but I'm going to go to Simone next. Hi. Okay. Well, um, my activism kind of passion for you didn't really start till later. Um, it started definitely, um, when the shootings this summer happened with Breonna Taylor, Muhammad Arbery, and George Floyd, those were the ones that really touched my heart to the point where I felt like I needed to do something in my community to just help bring people together. Because I know I was personally feeling attacked as a person of color when these shootings happen. I fear for my siblings, my dad, my black family that I don't, that I'm not close with, I, my mind instantly goes to them. And so when that happened, um, I was living in Tri-Cities at the time this summer and I got people of my community together to just kind of send a message, create a video just to support the Black Lives Matter movement because that is so important to me. And I didn't really get faced, um, I didn't really feel pressured to really take a stand with my activism until high school. And that was because I grew up in a private school where it was super small environment. Everybody knew everybody, everybody was friends with everybody. So we were one happy little family. I get into high school and that definitely changed. There were definitely different cliques and I was seen as a black girl. So. That being said, when um, the 
2016 election was going on, it was getting thrown in my face who was really racist on my campus and who was openly racist about it. And so just being, learning how to find my voice was definitely something that acquired um, a lot of just soul searching for me personally, because I was very shy, I didn't know how to stand up to people that were go that were okay with being openly and blatantly racist. And now that I'm older and I understand my voice and my passions and what I want to share, like, I'm not, I'm way more okay with speaking out, especially if I see something right in front of my face, other than in high school, younger me would have just kind of been quiet about it. So my activism was kind of like a slow, slow and steady journey, but just like the burning passion inside of me, knowing that I need to speak out and share my voice was definitely something that pushed me to be as active as I am today and starting the student athletes club um, where we can come together and just express how we feel about the social injustices and make the change that we want to see. So yeah, thank you again for having me. I, first of all, I want to say thanks again for sharing. I want to ask to, because it sounds very similar in parts of your stories that um, there has been a, a want to get involved with activism, but also almost a requirement for you. For those who maybe through privilege have not had to step into that light, um, who now want to get involved, to support, to help with change, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's trying to get involved but is unsure about where their place in it is or where they should get started? And anyone can start taking questions from here. Oh, I'm happy to take that. Perfect. Uh, so I think that one of the things that we've definitely seen this year specifically is how many resources really are available. So I would say that for people who don't feel that they don't really have a choice in activism, that there, there are all of these books about how to, and not books if like, you know, you see a book and you go, nope, too big, too daunting. There are articles, there are videos online that you can look at as resources to find a place to start from. Because the thing about like being a person of color is that you're expected to be like, someone with a PhD in race relations by the time you're in the first grade. And uh, I think that one of the things that you really want to be aware of as a person who either is uh, not a person of color or is not black, specifically black or indigenous, I guess, in this case, very tentatively putting that out there, um, not asking your black friends how to be and act like how to get involved is probably a really, really great place to start from because like there are all of these things that are out there and if you do a Google search and you don't click specifically on Fox News, you're probably gonna find at least something that will tell you what direction to go in because obviously there are lots of ways to get involved and lots of ways to be an activist and like I don't think any of us who are here tonight are gonna tell anybody that this is the, the end all be all way to be an activist. And I, um, I agree. I think do your own kind of research into it and see what you can do and see how you can get involved. So does anyone else have anything to add in regards to that before we move to the next um, question? Yeah. I was just going to add, um, say just to educate yourself as much as possible. And also just to go with your gut and listen to your intuition and whatever feels right, what group feels right, or even if it's just, if it's just something as simple as like a Facebook group that's just putting information out there, if that's like the first baby step that you need to do to get yourself comfortable with getting ready to share your voice for those next potential big moments, just take those baby steps because it is really important for you to feel comfortable where you are in activism. Just because if you aren't sound with the group that you're in, if you're not sound with sharing your voice just yet, it's not, your point's not going to be made clear. It's not going to come across as how you want it to be. So just 
get educated and take the baby steps that you need in order for you to feel comfortable enough to grow with the people that you are surrounding yourself with. So, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Simone and Elena, for sharing. Um, I would like to first offer uh, an invitation to everybody watching this. We have been at the corner of Fifth and Main, although on weekends now we're at University and Sprague to try to get a little more student engagement. Um, we have been out protesting for, I believe it's 118 or 119 days um, consecutively. Um, so if you are looking, if you're a person that's in town that maybe was scared to come out, uh, we haven't had anything scary happen. Um, we do occasionally get threats, um, but any person of color knows that that's something that you experience just moving throughout the world. Um, um, no one's made good on anything. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to become involved and become an activist um, and doesn't mean just getting out there and protesting. You can uh, do like Instagram has a lot of great resources. There are people that are often asking for there are what's called mutual aid requests. So for example, like during the uh, during COVID, uh, black and uh, indigenous and other people of color being affected disproportionately, particularly black people. And there are mutual aid requests from people that are like, I can't pay my rent. Can you please help me? This is my cash app. This is my Venmo, et cetera. Um, those are really, really great direct, um, direct action ways to help. Uh, and also getting involved with any kind of local hub, like just joining a group, like there's Kittitas County um, Alliance for Racial Equity. Um, there's now Sunrise Club in Ellensburg. Um, that's about um, climate justice, which is also tied in with racial justice. Um, so yeah, there are, there are many ways, many, many ways. Thank you so much for asking. Thank you guys for that. And we will be, any resources that are shared tonight, we will be putting together a list that we'll email out to everyone. So if you didn't hear something or you missed something during the talk tonight, we make sure you get that in the end. Um, I want to move in a little bit to the digital side of activism. Um, specifically, how do you think the digital age, social media, the expansion, um, how has it impacted activism in the last couple of years? Um, I can take this one for starters. Um, I personally believe that the social media aspect of just activism has, it is both a beautiful and just, an, it's a conflicting topic because on one side of it, we're all sharing these things, we're all reposting, we're all getting, sharing the information, people are reading about what we're sharing. That's the thing that we need to really take note of, especially within ourselves, is if we're going to repost that, are we actually taking the time to read through that article? Or are we just reading the headline of it and then sharing it? Because it sounds like we are supporting the issue that's going on in society today. We really need to take a look at what's just like a retweet. What's that going to really do at the end of the day? I mean, it's going to make you look good. That's, that's, that's an issue that I know we have is that some people are just posting just so that they look good, so that they look like they're aware and like they know what's going on. There's a difference between actually educating yourself and taking the steps in order to be able to have these hard and difficult conversations. And then there's just that simple repost that you put on your story for the 24 hours and then it's gone. And people see that you posted it and they like, okay, you're an activist. We get it. That's cool. And half the time those links aren't even going to be clicked on. So it's not even just, it's not just about the postings. It's about what you're sharing, how intentional and consistent you are with sharing that stuff. And just actually, I, I would even make an effort to really just like reach out to individual people that you know are going to share those as well. Like just DM your friends and be like, hey, read this and share it to other people that you know are going to be actually take it to heart not just post it because it's what the mainstream media is posting right now 
Um, Elena, Sarah, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I was going to say that I think one of the really great things about having social media be what it is, is our ability to organize. Uh, so like, it's really wonderful that we're able to do things. Um, I was at a march at Capitol, um, at Capitol Hill in Seattle a while ago that was huge and that there was like no sort of public information about it. It was like word of mouth and social media and it was, it was insane. Like I could see like as really as far as you, the eye could see it was people wow. marching and it was incredible. But I also think that we get really caught into things that may or may not be true and that we're not that good at fact checking. So like we've all learned how we're supposed to do research for school but as soon as we look at social media stuff that all goes out the window and we go this is a great headline and I like it but I don't really want to do any more looking into it. So I find that like Snopes is is really wonderful because it goes I go, oh, is this actually true, right? And I think that that's one of the things that's problematic is that we really wanna be outraged about things before we've figured out whether those are things that are actually happening. So it really is the double-edged sword. And um, on a happier note, uh, I've been doing a, like my own personal social media campaign on my Instagram. I'm doing a, a story time and I'm uh, every day uh, weekdays I'm doing like a picture book that I'm reading that's like more diverse than sort of your average this is a white princess and she gets saved by a white prince and also there's a dragon um, sort of a different take on that I'm trying really hard to do that so you know if anyone has any more book titles they can hit me up but I'm, I'm trying to do the quiet for children yes. side of, of social media and activism myself and I think what I'm hearing a bit here too is that it's not just about using your social media to share information. It's checking that information, making sure it's quality because sometimes if you do send it to those friends and it's not a quality source, you've now just spread misinformation or um, facts that are not true about certain communities or certain movements. Um, and then also using it strategically, looking at how you can share and be creative with it um, outside of the just posting to a story and letting it dissolve into the unknown. Um, I know that Leanna has a question. Leanna, do you want to come on and ask that? I think you're still muted. I love technology. Yay! I was muted. So, you know, I was noticing with both of you is that with talking with social media and the benefits of it is that it's good that you're having uh, a further outreach to a larger community. But do you feel that with um, with titles or articles not being written that it may, um, as Sara, is that right, um, had mentioned or that... Um, that it isn't going further than that. Do you find that more action going in? I, I guess what I'm kind of wondering is, is um, the action part of it to the social media and how those two kind of combined and how you can go like the step further of like, you, you get the word out into um, knowing what's happening and you know movements that you want to do and promote and then um you know bringing people in and having them be a bit more active within that movement is that do you is is there um is there a combination of the two or do you find that there's a, a hindrance or there's like a lack of communication between the two of them i, I was just kind of wondering about that so um you can come back to it later or, or <laughs> um as you kind of wonder so about are you um, asking a little bit about taking the step past social media out yeah. into more real world um, action? Yes. Um, like with behavior or choosing to attend certain things or to protest. Is that you're looking for the connection between social media? Mm. Yes, is thank that... you for clarifying. <laughs> that definitely is the sort of performative activism part. Mm -hmm where people want to look good so they post the black square and then they don't actually make any effort. I think this is a pretty big thing, right? Like 
I have lots of friends who want to post a lot about like, oh, Black Lives Matter, but then don't actually put their money where their mouth is, or in this case, their feet where their mouth is. Um, I feel like for some people, it might be all that they're capable of doing because they're in an unsafe situation or because they aren't in a place where they can go out with other people or they have an, an immuno, um, they're immunocompromised or something right now, for okay. sure. But I think that social, like the, the really great thing, again, sort of about social media is that you can find other people who are like-minded and you can organize together and then go, like actually go and do something. And this year specifically, we have seen a global movement in support of Black Lives Matter, which has never happened before, which never, like, never happened before, but would not have been possible without Twitter. Um, I see Sara getting very, very excited about that. And I do think that social media can be a beautiful thing when used correctly, right? Um, it can create these connections and give us pathways, but at the same time, there's another side to that. Um, and I think it's important for anyone in getting involved in activism to understand both sides of that sword, right? To see how they can use it effectively and how they can avoid using it harmfully. Um, so, and we've kind of touched on performative activism a bit. Is there anything else that any of the panelists would like to mention? before kind of moving to the next issue? Are you asking about performative activism? A or little bit, yeah, sorry. Okay, um, well, I would like to um, build off what Elena said and Simone said that, yeah, I see a lot of people, a lot of people um, just posting the black square on Instagram back from June 2nd, like the, the, the social media blackout. Um, which I have my critiques of, but, um, and then not doing anything, uh, not having the hard conversations with people. Like, I don't think that everybody has to be on the ground. I understand that some people, like Elena said, are not capable of it. Um, maybe you have a chronic illness, maybe you have asthma, maybe you are a caretaker for somebody young or old or both, um, you know, uh, but being able to have those hard conversations, because we actually had a, a old classmate of mine come up to the protest and he was like, I can't protest right now. Like, I don't have time, but what can I be doing? And I was like, having hard conversations with racist, like, I mean, I don't know why people would have racist friends, like just cut them off, but relatives and people that are in your life and speaking up when it happens around you. Um, because yeah, I think, uh, I think, there is definitely a large problem with performative activism. And I don't think it's that hard to make noise when somebody makes an, uh, a racist joke or, or comment or something like that. I, I really don't think it's most of the time in most situations putting um, white people in danger to speak up against that. Um, obviously there are exceptions to that, but yeah, that's, that's, um, I could talk about that for hours, so I'm just gonna mute myself. I was told once, because um, I was talking about anxious feelings in certain situations, and I was told that as a white person, I was putting my anxiety before the value of someone else's life or their safety, and it seemed a little, at the first, at first, I'm an anxious person, so I was like, okay, but thinking that way has really made it easier for me to speak up in certain situations, placing my, I guess, anxiety behind looking and valuing someone else's life, really put it into perspective for me um, and really helped. So I think sometimes people need to hear that. Um, I also, I just had a question come in from Dylan and he asked a little bit in regards to what Elena was saying and Sarah, what you said about people being um, unable to engage in certain forms of activism because of either the pandemic guidelines or certain health reasons. And he said, how can our real world impact have the most effect while adhering to pandemic and safety rules? I think Sara answered that a little bit within your question, but I wanted to know if anyone else had any advice how to 
be active, but adhere to specific guidelines? Uh, I think, I mean, this doesn't work as well right now, but inviting your friends to take part in things that you're doing. I invited my friend, I mean friends, haha, to this, but um, most of them are, you know, working and some of them have children. So uh, that didn't entirely work as well as I'd hoped, but inviting your friends to take part in like my story times. I'm like, please share them with everyone that you think might enjoy this content and inviting your friends if you are going to be able to go to a march that's going to be social distanced ish and wearing your masks and all the rest of that stuff i think that's a really great way or your mutuals or whatever the kids are calling them these days you know you're like friends <laughs> your online friends your real life friends uh and also that those hard conversations they're not always about race right like right now definitely this election is calling into question stuff about LGBT people, LGBTQIA people, and how like potentially terrible, not even potentially, terrible things could and are, could be and are, and uh, having those hard, hard conversations I think are really important now as ever too. Like when you hear someone who's using the R slur, cutting them off, when you're hearing people describing things as gay because they think that that's like, a synonym for something bad, like really calling those people out and then thinking to yourself, are these people who are using these terms or having like saying these things and normalizing them, are those people that are worth it to keep in my life? And usually you'll find that the answer is no. Very true. Um, I uh, thank you for sharing all of that. And uh, I uh, really one of the goals I think of tonight, especially since we are so involved with media, social media, I really wanted to help students understand these pitfalls along with performative activism and what it looks like to go that step beyond. And I really just thank you guys for sharing that information with us. And I actually, I'm gonna move into a couple other questions. And this one actually, it came from our leadership team and it said, um, Sorry, do you have advice for individuals who are attempting to cope with living with or having family that are not supportive of them engaging or supporting a cause or social movement? Um, I actually have that going on in my family where I have members of my family that are just not understanding of my of my personal beliefs and um i have tended to i was i was raised in a very respect your authorities um and your elders and just respect what they believe and nine times out of ten what they say goes and everything and so as a child having that mindset that um really sets you up for when you get into adulthood and when you start to have your own beliefs and things that you want to do and then you are having these tough conversations with these adult and um elderly figures in your life especially if it is family um that's really hard to have these conversations with people about racism about hate about climate change um the lgbtq community anything that just anything that is far left or far right gun like all of the bases I've, I've covered all the bases with some of these family members and so being able to understand especially for yourself if you are going to get into one of these conversations and it might be your great grandma and you know that she is so set in her ways that you know, nothing's gonna change that. And it's really more about how, how do you, how are you gonna feel after that conversation? Are you gonna feel better that you had that conversation or is it going to feel exhausting and like a waste of time for you? And that's where, I, just so you can take care of yourself with those moments, because there are gonna be some people that you get in a conversation with and you're never gonna reach, you're never gonna reach what they, what they need to be what needs to be heard they're never going to want to listen because they they don't want to hear it and so it's about 
putting your time and energy into people that are going to be open to change. And so having conversations, maybe just open up the conversation. If it doesn't even sound like it's going to go anywhere, I probably wouldn't waste my time with it, especially if it was with my 90 year old grandma. <laughs> like, she's not going to change her views on that. But if it's, if it's an uncle or an aunt or a close friend that you know, like one conversation might not get through to them right away, but if you keep chipping away at it and in a loving way too, it's not attacking their personal beliefs, but it's showing them that this is what's happening. These are the facts because you're educated and you have done your research. And so you're back, you're backing up your statements with facts and your beliefs with facts. So doing that with these people that are, I understand the tough conversations. It's just, it's about choosing your battles and who you really want to make an impact with. It's probably not going to be your 90 year old grandma, but your uncle or aunt or cousin, distant cousin, you can help those people see and just understand where you're coming from better. Sorry, I kind of went on a long rant there, but. Oh, I really enjoyed, and I'm going to let other panelists answer. I just wanted to share, because you said 90-year-old grandmother. Um, I actually, I call my 90-year-old grandmother every day, and before this year, we had never talked about race in a conversation, barely ever, and I don't think there's a day that we don't talk about it now. Um, she actually is calling me after the debate tonight, so we can discuss politics. Um, so I think you're completely right in that fact that you choose which conversations to have. And there'll be nights where I bring up stuff and she'll be like, Megan, I gotta go. And then she'll call me two days later and she's like, okay, I'll talk about it. So I really think you see that value in where you spend your energy and where you don't. Um, but sometimes that conversation with your 90 year old grandmother may encourage her to vote in the next election and really be active. So I think I just wanted to share that because it just seemed right. <laughs> um, Sara, would you like to share? Because I thought I saw you going to unmute. Yeah, thanks. Um, I so I wanted to first of all uh, kind of like a little bit respond to what Simone was saying. Like I don't I don't think, and this is my personal opinion. This isn't like you know the rules of engagement, but I don't think any person of color should ever feel like they are the person that needs to have that conversation explicitly I mean white people need to be having these hard conversations with other white people um that that is the that is the work I don't ever think that a person of color should ever feel pressured to do that um if they want to that's awesome and that's great but I I'm not of the opinion um that that should be their work white white supremacy is a white people problem that is going to be solved you know what I mean? Like when white people hold each other accountable. Um, so talk, responding to the question of how do I, how do I manage my activism? How do I, uh, oh, sorry. My phone was giving me a low battery alert. Um, <laughs> oh, goody. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, boundaries are really important. Not everybody has to know what you're doing. Uh, you can be doing covert activism or some online work via disseminating, you know, like I said, mutual aid um, requests or by, I mean, like, let's say that maybe you were really, really wanting to get people um, to register to vote so that we don't have Trump in office um, for another four years. Uh, you don't have to necessarily do that in person. You can kind of um, uh, canvas over the internet and there's this app called voter pal that you can download from the app store other people can download it and you can get yourself registered to vote there's also many options online for getting to register to vote just just as an example right um and if it's a parent or something like that and you've gone to, uh, on a day trip with your friend to seattle to a march uh that that is a part of boundaries they don't necessarily um, I mean, obviously, if you're a minor, it could get really sticky. And if you're financially dependent on them, it could get a really sticky situation. But sometimes just omitting um, information is the best way to deal with somebody whose mind is not going to be changed and could potentially uh, use their leverage over you in a really not safe or um, uh, otherwise bad way. Thank you for asking that, by the way. 
I um, I thank you for sharing that. And I Erin uh, just shared in the chat too. She says, as white people, it's not our prerogative to feel comfortable. It's our job to work against white supremacy in ourselves and others. And I just felt like that really needed to be voiced across this. Um, I would like to move to one more, one or two more questions that are on our list. And we have a question from Sydney in the chat that I'm gonna just save a little bit longer. Um, but another thing is we wanted to know a little bit more about the background behind activism. So let me, like, what does it look like to organize before mobilizing like in a movement? And I'm gonna direct it first to Sara because I know you are a local organizer with Ellensburg Calls to Action. And most times we get to see that outcome, but we don't see the behind the scenes. So a couple people are curious what that looks like. Woo wee, okay. So uh, first, Ellensburg Calls to Action was originally, I just thought it was going to be a little, I, I okay, explaining it the other day to a fellow protester, I said the reason we have the group is because I felt like group chats are annoying, but we needed somewhere to share the information because there was this calls to act, call to action from this black community member at the very first March. And this young man was like, I wanna see you all at the courthouse every day until justice is, is like, you know, until we see justice. And I'm like, okay. And like, I was on board. I personally couldn't go at that, that, that time. I didn't get there for the first week because I'm a farmer and I was hand raising an abandoned duckling. And I was like, I was, I don't know, like it's a lot of work and I was worried about her safety. And like, also too, I don't want to like, I didn't want something weird to happen at the protest. And like, I get shoved over. I get like, I accidentally kill this duckling. I'm like traumatized. Like I just didn't, I didn't want to deal with any of that. So um, the, the first week I was like, how can I help? You know what I mean? Like I can't physically be there. Like many people can't physically be there. So I made this Facebook group and then it just took on a life of its own. And now there's like 600 plus people in there. Um, so in terms of like what the making the sausage looks like, um, it is very much having hard conversations with each other. Um, there's conflict. Conflict needs to be resolved. There's also different ideas of the ways that things should be approached um, and different people with different um, experiences. So a lot of the, like, if anybody's driven by the protests, you know that daily there are not 600 people there. Um, and and uh, according to Facebook statistics, there's uh, an average of 485 active members. And I don't know what the criteria for that is, but that means that at least like over half the group is kind of actively engaging with the Facebook group. Um, so a lot of the behind the scenes is like, that's kind of a hub to communicate and to let people know about activism related um, events going on in Ellensburg or just local calls to action. But then also too, there is the recruitment. Like that's part of what I'm doing right now. I'm also, I'm very glad that you guys asked me to speak and to be very, very frank, I was like, this is awesome because I think that we need to get more, we, we need more people because even if we weren't doing this during the pandemic, activism work burns people out, activism work of any kind. And so people that have been there every day um, are having to, um, oh, I'm gonna have to mute myself because my girlfriend's here with dinner and my dog is going to freak out. Um, but um, um, a, a lot of it basically just looks like group chats, etc. Oh, she got him to quiet down. Awesome, we love that, we love that. Um, 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 but yeah, a lot of it just looks like uh, these, the, the struggles and rewards of human interaction in a group. I'm going to mute myself um, real quick. So I would take away from that as a person who is maybe engaging and not on the organization side, it helps for us to be active, to be responsive, to be engaged because it lets you know that we're there, we wanna be involved and it helps see your product and your accomplishment and what is happening. Um, would anyone else like to add in regards to like organizing um, before mobilization efforts or anything like that? Um, I'll just add that it really starts with a structured 
plan and a passion and just getting the right people together. Once you get that small group of people together that are super passionate about the idea that you are trying to create, trying to share, then they'll be able to pull more people in and they'll be able to help you get that idea to blossom because the more minds, the better. And so once you get that going, you'll need to set a timeline so that you stick to that timeline so that you have an I personally like timelines that where it's more small goals that are quite frequent. So like every five days, every three days, we're going to do something small. We're going to accomplish another something small. And just so it's still close together. So it's still consistently not on your mind, but not to the point where you're stressed out about it. And assigning other people, these, this small group of people, different days so that they can devote their full attention for those five to that task that they've been given so then by the end of this everybody's um everybody has pulled from their resources everybody has given their ideas given their passions given their thoughts into that project little piece of this big project that you're putting together and so it's a little bit of everybody but once it all comes together then it's then it's something amazing so I just that's that's how I like to plan things personally Perfect. Thank you guys for sharing all that. And I find it really helpful. I think sometimes people don't see, they see the tip of the iceberg, right? And they don't see everything else that is happening before they see visually what is occurring. I did want to ask before we wrap up, um, Sydney's question, which I think is a really nice one. She said, I've heard from some of my favorite creators that it is important to support the art and happiness of marginalized communities and not just the tragedy. What are your favorite pieces of art that make you happy and represent you, like books, movies, TV shows, etc.? Okay, um, as an artist, um, this question really resonates with me. Um, I don't really have any uh, personal examples of art or um, movies or something that makes me feel seen, but I really, really, really think it is important for um, part of, especially if you're a white person um, doing racial advocacy, is to support the joy of Black and Indigenous and other people of color. Uh, I was act, I've just been talking to my fellow protesters about this that we need a, we need more people on the ground because I'm an artist I haven't had time to make art this year because I've I've been so involved in organizing um, and you know uh, just financially supporting an artist like there are black artists out there that have their 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 cash app their Venmo um, whatever uh, their PayPal in their bio. Um, supporting them in very tangible ways, or if you can't buy art, you can't give art to them, or not give art, give um, give cash them. Um, share share their share their works. You know what I mean. Um, and also too uh, on being focused on like you know um, black and indigenous and other people of color's joy. Um, make sure that like if you're checking you're not only checking in with your friends of color um uh when you have like a question to ask them um make reach out to them make sure they're okay if there's something that you know makes them happy like you know you have a, a friend who's black and you know that they're really struggling and you know that they love chocolate filled croissants bring them by like you know what i mean like their their treat that they like um i think things like that are really really important and i think a lot of times overlooked um, especially too, because uh, many marginalized or oppressed people have a problem or have an issue uh, being seen as vulnerable. So taking that on preemptively and being like, hey, you know what, like I might not see you out here crying, but you're probably going through a lot. I would like to support your joy. Let me do this for you. Thank you so much for asking that, Sydney. Would um, Simone or Elena, do you have more? Yes. Yes, I'm so <laughs> glad you asked. Let's talk about things that make us happy. Um, so I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the, it's like Tale of Blood and Bone. The cover looks creepy, give it a chance, especially if you're feeling disillusioned about JK Rowling right now. Um, if you don't know, 
look into it. But yes, Sh Shadow of Blood and Bone, I, I think. Hmm. By Tomi Adeyemi, that's the author. That'll help you more than, than me butchering the title. Uh, it's a book series that is sort of Africana and um, has magic and cool adventures and stuff and is very, very good. And I definitely felt more seen than other works of fiction have, have made me feel. Also, if you like comic books, uh, they're, the Niobe ones are super good. And I think Amanda Stenberg was also part of helping with that. Uh, at, at, and then there's also a, a mixed gentleman who I think his name's like Sebastian Jones or something who is, don't quote me on that name. Uh, but the Niobe ones, if you're more interested in graphic novels and comic books, for sure. And if you have little little ones or you also like really beautiful like kids books the um the dragon takes a wife is a really really wonderful very visual and really beautiful story that uh sort of slips in a, a racial conversation without bl being blatant about it at all where the fairy just happens to be black and it's never addressed and it's not a big deal um I love books. And I got really, really, really tired of being a, uh, someone who likes books who never got to see myself in them. Eventually, I'll probably end up writing one because you cannot even, well, if you are white, you probably cannot imagine how frustrating it is to read and to love stories and books and never see yourself in them. And to have, like, you know how disappointed I was when I found out that Hermione Granger was going to be white in those movies? That broke my heart. And it's, it's stuff like that where it's like you try to put yourself into stories that you don't, don't belong in and that's really hard. So like, I think that works of fiction that can reassure us, you know, like the new um, Little Mermaid that's coming out or the fact that uh, Yara Shahidi is gonna be playing Tinkerbell. Like these are really important or Black Panther, right? Like I, had a, I have a friend who said, well, it wasn't that good of a story and I went, Imagine you are me. And he went, oh, yeah, 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 it was great, it was great. So I think, like, encouraging those things are really, really important and really wonderful. And, um, yeah, reassure yourselves that you're doing the right thing, that you're on the right side of history. And I have a feeling that you can definitely check out Elena's Instagram for more stories, for more content that you can be supporting, too, as well. And um, Simone, I wanted to give you a chance before we wrap up, if there was any other um, creators or any aspect that you wanted to add to that. Um, I personally like to indulge myself in music. Um, I love Spotify. It's an amazing, amazing platform. And one of my favorite things is just really just going through and just looking for Black artists. And they have this whole genre that is dedicated to Black history podcasts. And so just I and one of my favorites is when it's February and it's Black History Month and they have that whole genre set aside. And so just really indulging in those and also my artwork that I have from um, black creators and things like that. So just really, um, I really enjoy seeking out black creators and just especially ones that create beautiful things, but might be on the smaller platform side. And so just getting their work out. So when people do see that super cool shirt that I'm wearing, or people do see these super cool paintings that every time I'm on a Zoom meeting, somebody wants to talk about them behind me. And so it's just like, those are th that's what brings me joy is being able to share those things and I'm not very artistic I'm not super creative like that but um I just know that there are so many other black creators out there that do need to be shared because some of the work all of the work in my personal opinion is just stunning so yeah thank you and um we're gonna wrap it up for tonight. I would like to say thank you to all of our panelists for coming and sharing with us tonight um, and joining in on this conversation. I know for SWAP this year, it's really important to us that we lend our platform to voices that can speak on things that we aren't able to. 
um, at times. And so that is a goal of ours this year is to completely just keep lending this platform to others. Um, I uh, did want to say we have a couple other announcements and we will be sending out an email that has any kind of resources, um, any ways to get engaged in the local community. Sarah has mentioned a ton and she also briefly mentioned Sunrise Hub. Um, Molly was going to attend tonight but was unable to make it. And so Sunrise Hub is a local organization that's just starting in regards to climate justice. And they, I think, are meeting on Mondays. Uh, they are on our Instagram and we'll share again and we'll share in the email how you can get involved with them. Um, Ellensburg Calls to Action is also on Instagram, on Facebook, that um, community is there. Um, and we will send out even more. So we did want everyone to know that. And um, does anyone else have any resources they want to share before? Um, I'm dropping uh, the Instagram handle in the chat real quick. That's why I'm changing my ankle. <laughs> um, and I saw Elena's Instagram is also in the chat too, if you want to check out what she is doing. Oh, sorry. Elena is going to put her Instagram handle in the chat if it's not there already. So you can follow along and see what she's doing with her book series. And if there's anything that I've just forgotten, um, Student Athletes for Social Justice, Simone, um, do you have any information on that? So I'm going to actually be getting um, Zoom meetings together later this month. I um, need to talk with my um, athletic advisor and my coach who have both been super involved with getting this club off the ground. Um, but I have a number of students that are really interested in it. So Zoom meetings for that, we're going to be starting those later this month. And um, yeah, so that's really all the information that I have on it now. We have, we're still forming our committee board right now. And so once we get that going, then I, then I know we'll be able to get an Instagram up and we'll be able to get more information out. But by the end of this month, for sure, we'll be up and rolling. So I'm very excited about that. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I am also, sorry, Jamie is in the same room as me. So I have a little birdie on this side of my ear. Um, what did you say? Oh, Sydney, she asked if you could hold up the book again for those who did not see it when you held it up. Um, right there, that is Children of Blood and Bone. So that's what it looks like. Um, and I also have... I'm going to put into the chat um, a feedback form so so we can keep hosting these types of conversations, these meetings. Um, we would love your feedback on how this ran, um, any other topics that you would like to see talked about and addressed. Um, so I've put that there. And there's also an option within that if you'd like to be added to our email list, you can either put it through the feedback form or you can even post it in the chat right here and we'll make sure you get added to our weekly emails. I also have one more thing to share on the screen, um, which is some of our upcoming events, which I hope you all can see that. Um, but upcoming, so tomorrow, we all believe in some self-care. And so we are encouraging students and the community to take a break and come in color with SWAP. We have a couple sites posted in our Instagram bio currently, and if you want to engage, you can color online, color on your own sheets, but we'll be doing a Zoom session where you can come and join, and Jackson, our vice president, is heading that up, so he will be there to welcome you and um, share any resources you may be looking for. Then next week on October 6th, leading up to National Coming Out Day on October 11th, we are having a CW alum. He comes from physics and aviation. Um, Josh Altier, he is going to be speaking on how to be an ally to the LGBTQ plus community, especially when voting. So not only is it important to support during the coming out process, but how can you support within your behaviors and your actions um, later on. And then from there, a couple of our upcoming meetings. On the 13th, we are going to have a discussion about domestic violence advocacy. We'll have a guest alumni speaker. We'll be discussing um, advocacy, specifically advocacy in the Ellensburg community. 
um, in recognition of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And then on the 20th, we have Every Vote Matters. So Joanna Hunt, who works at CW and is a past alumni, she'll be breaking down the importance of not just voting for the president, but especially our senators, congresspersons, governors, et cetera, and showing how you can make a difference just through voting. So um, those will be shared across our social media and through our email list as well. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing those. And um, I just want to say thank you again to our panelists and thank you for being here tonight. If anyone has any other questions um, or if not, I don't think so. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we will see you next Tuesday and we really appreciate everyone for coming. So thank you guys so much for asking me to speak and thank you Simone and Elena for sharing. I loved what you all had to say. Um, and, um, yeah, I hope to see some of you at the protest. Don't forget to vote. Like, yes. I know that you're getting it from everywhere. Like, Spotify has, like, are you registered to vote even? And actually, the, the NFL on, on Fox is also asking if you're registered to vote. So that's really cool. But vote. Vote, please. Please. We so need you to. Like, don't st stay home and vote. Yes. And thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you. No, thank you for allowing me to speak. I really appreciate that for reaching out. So thank you guys. You guys are great. Thank you.